Good day, great tens. I hope you're all doing well and you're all staying safe at home. Uh, what we're going to do in this video is we're just going to go through the slides for animal tissue and I'm just going to give you a bit of context to help you understand it a bit better. I know this is the last thing you want to do right now, but the more you do now, the less you have to do when we get back to school. So just follow along. If you haven't made the notes yet, then this is a good opportunity for you to take out your notebook and take notes as we go through. And if you have made the notes, then just sit back and watch the explanation and make sure you understand all of the work. Okay, so let's start. So firstly, we're just going to look at a definition for tissue again. So it's the same definition as for plant tissue. It's groups of specialized cells with specific structure and functions. Okay, but the types of tissue we find in animal tissue or in animals are different than plants. So here's an example of the tissues we find in, um, in animals. And we're going to look at all of these different types of tissues as we go through. Okay, here's just the same diagram I have at the start of most topics, just to organize yourself a bit. So we started with the chemistry of life, then we looked at atoms and molecules, and then we looked at cells, and now we're looking at tissue, and how that tissue makes up different organs, and then organ systems, and then finally, organisms. Okay, so we're going to look at how these cells combine to form tissue layers. And this is just another diagram that shows the same thing. So here you see a couple of different tissue layers and how they combine to form an organ. Okay, so it's, it's like the same idea, uh, just a different diagram. Okay, and here you see all of the different tissue types. So we have epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscular tissue, and nervous tissue. And under each of these, they, they are further subdivided. And we're going to look at all of these types of tissue. So it might get confusing. So we might be busy with cartilage. And then you're not sure, but where does cartilage fit in? So then you can just come back to the slide and you see that, oh, it's part of the connective tissue. You can also look here on the right-hand side. There's a little um, box that helps you identify what we are busy with at the moment. So there will be a little arrow there that tells you, okay, we are now busy with connective tissue. So then the first type of tissue is the epithelial tissue and a layer of epithelial tissue is called epithelium. Okay, so the epithelium covers the body and it lines the internal organs inside of the body. Okay, so what this basically means is, I've mentioned this before if you've been in my class, that your body is basically like a donut. So, see if I can draw a man here. Not a very good diagram of a man, but there you go. Um, so you have the skin on the outside, which is there, let's say it's the red, but then you also, this is the man's eye and mouth, um, then you also have a hole running right through the man from his mouth to his anus. So that makes your body almost like a donut. So there's a, you have the outside layer and then this hole running through the middle. Now, wh why I'm bring this up is because everything that is exposed to the outside, so that is your skin and also the inside uh, of your organs, has a, a layer of epithelium tissue that covers it to protect it from the outside. So it's a very tightly packed layer that, um, that doesn't allow substances just to come in, um, so that it controls what comes in and what goes out, um, so it's specialized for um, exposing your body to the outside. So whether that is your skin or the lining of your internal organs. Okay, sorry for my little diagram here. Um, so it covers the outside of the body and lines the organs. They are tightly packed. They can be single or multi-layered. And then their general functions include protection, absorption of substances, secretion, and excretion of substances. So these two sound the same uh, and the is very similar but secretion is when your body gives off useful things so it makes things you uh, makes useful substances and then gives it off like saliva your salivary glands secrete saliva whereas excretion is when your body gets rid of waste like carbon dioxide or urea so it's when your body gives off uh, useless things to be excreted out of the body okay so uh, just a clarification there between the two 
then the types of epithelial tissue uh, or the different types of epithelial tissue we find. So firstly we have squamous epithelium and they are brick shaped very similar to the epidermis we looked at in plant tissue. Then cuboidal epithelium and as the name suggests they are cube shaped. Columnar epithelium so they are column shaped or rectangles. And then ciliated epithelium is like columnar epithelium but they have these little hair-like projections on top of them called cilia. And we're going to look at what those cilia do when we get there. Then also you, have, uh, you can either have uh, epithelium uh, organized as one layer called simple epithelium or multiple layers called stratified epithelium. So on the next slide uh, just shows you if you have one layer then it's called simple squamous epithelium or stratified squamous epithelium when you have more than one layer. Okay, but it's not too important at grade 10 level. You should just be aware that there is these different types. That's important, the different types of epithelium, but that they can also be one layer or they can be multiple layers. So the first type of uh, epithelium is squamous epithelium. And where do we find squamous epithelium? We find them in the alveoli of the lungs. Uh, also, in the vascular system, we find them in blood capillaries and blood vessels. So they are mainly in the lungs and in the blood vessels. So based on that, we might guess some of its functions. So the first function is gaseous exchange. So because it is found in the lungs, one of its main functions is to allow gases in and out. So the exchange of gases. Then next, because they are thinner than the other types of epithelium, um, they allow for easy diffusion. So this makes sense if they are found in the blood and the lungs, then you want things to easily move in and out of them if those things are allowed to move in and out. Um, so they uh, must be thinner to allow for easier diffusion into and out of the lungs and into and out of the blood. Okay, then they are also smooth to reduce friction. But these first two are the main ones that we're going to be focusing on in grade 10. Okay, then here's the diagram you have to draw for squamous epithelium. So it's straightforward. You just draw what you see. Okay, so you draw, I'm drawing with a mouse, so it's not the best. Okay, so you just draw three of those. You draw the nucleus, and you draw here the basement membrane. And then here for the alveolar connective tissue, you can just draw a couple of lines like this. That's what we usually do on the board, uh, just to indicate that there's a um, uh, another layer here called the areola connective tissue which is another type of tissue we'll actually look at later uh, which connects the or binds the uh, epithelium with the lower layers but we'll look at that later okay so just make sure that you make this drawing into your books okay and don't forget the heading then the next type of epithelium is the cuboidal epithelium so where do we find these in the glands okay so glands are things that secrete um, substances like salivary glands and sweat glands and you also find them in the kidneys so again based on their location we might guess some of their functions so glands secrete substances and releases them and the kidney reabsorbs useful substances and secrete or excrete substances so cuboidal epithelium is really involved with secretion and excretion of substances um, so one way to remember it okay, is think when you see cuboidal, then you know secretion and excretion. Then you know that, oh, okay, that's the glands and, oh, yes, the kidneys. So if you can bind all of those things together, then you don't have to remember as many facts. Okay, so just remember cuboidal is for excretion and secretion. Okay, and then you must draw the cuboidal epithelium. So very simple, very similar to the previous one. You just draw a cube shape now, and then the basement membrane, and the areola connective tissue. Then we look at columnar epithelium. Where do we find columnar epithelium? Mostly in the digestive system, or alimentary canal. And because it is in the digestive system, the main functions uh, of the columnar epithelium is absorption. Okay, so it's highly absorptive to absorb substances, uh, nutrients and water that goes through the digestive system that needs to be absorbed into the body. 
Okay, so one of the main functions of columnar epithelium is absorption. But also, to help move these things through the digestive system, especially fat, um, the, some of the uh, columnar epithelium cells secretes mucus to help lubricate the movement of these things through the digestive system. And you'll see now in the next diagram, we show you a type of cell that's specially designed to secrete the mucus. Okay, so here you see the columnar epithelium. Um, and again, drawing very similar to the previous ones, but here you see something called a goblet cell. And that is the cell that, uh, or the type of columnar um, epithelium cell that secretes the mucus. So make sure you draw a couple of dots in there to show that there's mucus inside. Uh, and the function of this cell is to secrete the mucus. Okay, so make sure you draw this. And next we look at ciliated epithelium. So ciliated epithelium, as mentioned earlier, is similar to columnar epithelium in shape, but they have these hair-like projections called cilia on top of them. And this is very important for the functions that we're going to look at in a second. Okay, but first, where do we find ciliated epithelium? In the air passages going to the lungs, in the oviduct or fallopian tubes that goes to the ovaries in the female reproductive system, and in the urinary tubes that transport urine out of the body. So all three of these have vital transport functions. I'm not going to write it out all, um, but they, they're vital in transporting substances. And you'll see that now when we get to um, the functions. So firstly, uh, we must understand that you also have goblet cells um, or ciliated goblet cells that secrete mucus. So these first couple of functions is related to the secretion of mucus. Okay, so mucus traps foreign bodies, so it prevents things from going where it's not supposed to. So in the air passages, it traps the foreign bodies, so it doesn't make it way, uh, makes its way to the lungs. Also, um, the mu mucus moistens the air, so if you're in a dry environment, then it can sometimes feel like um, the air you're breathing in is drying out your lungs. Um, so to prevent that from happening, the mucus moistens the air. And then the cilia, um, so this again refers mostly to um, the air passages, um, but the cilia makes flickering movements to remove foreign bodies uh, from, the, uh, from the air passages. So it moves back and forth um, and it removes the foreign bodies and moves it out. Then it also helps to transport egg cells in the, uh, to the uterus and uh, it helps to transport, uh, transport urine to the bladder. Okay, so you can see these last three has to do with the special type of function um, that these cilia have in transporting substances. Okay, and again, you must draw the ciliated epithelium. So very similar to the previous ones. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. And here you see all of the different uh, epithelium types and where you can find them in the body. Okay, then finally we get to connective tissue. Okay, so we are done with epithelial tissue for now. So now we move on to connective tissue. So there's many different types of connective tissue um, and they all, it's not like the epithelial tissue where you can clearly see they are related. Uh, these are many different types with many different functions in the body. But the two key characteristics of connective tissue is that they are all made of living cells that is surrounded by some sort of non-living matrix. So you'll see when we get into it um, what, what I mean or what we mean by matrix, uh, but it is living and non-living uh, things that work together. And why this uh, or um, what connective tissue does and why the non-living and living part is so important is it uh, usually provides support and connection. So it's very strong tissue. So it joins and supports other tissue. The types of tissue we're going to look at under connective tissue that we find under connective tissue is blood, bone, cartilage, ligaments and tendons, and then areolar connective tissue. Okay, so blood is the first type of connective tissue. And if we look at blood, we see that it consists of many different types of cells and substances. So first we have the erythrocytes, or the red blood cells, so yeah, they are 
colored red, so they're not uh, easy to miss. Then we have the leukocytes or the white blood cells, so that's uh, presented here with that um, translucent cell with the purple inside. The thrombocytes, uh, which you can see here is the yellow fragments there. And then the plasma, which is just the liquid part of the blood. Okay, and then this diagram you have to draw, but um, usually how we do this in class is I just tell you to start off by drawing uh, a little circle or a big circle, about 10 lines. And then as we go through the different tissue types or different blood tissue cells, um, I tell you to add the parts that we are busy with so that you see how they all come together. But at the end, you must have this diagram in your book. Okay, so then first part of blood we look at is the erythrocytes. My sprinklers just went on. I hope it doesn't isn't too distracting. Um, so the first part is the erythrocytes or red blood corpuscles. So we don't call them cells. We do sometimes say cells uh, or oftentimes say red blood cells, but it's actually corpuscles. And here's a little note that explains the difference. So a corpuscle is a minute free-floating cell that lacks a nucleus and organelles. So this red blood corpuscle doesn't have any nucleus or organelles in it. Um, it just has a cell membrane and then um, uh, cytoplasm inside of it and um, a hemoglobin and the things that it needs, but it doesn't have a nucleus and organelles. So I might sometimes say cells, it's just slip of the tongue, but they are actually called red blood corpuscles. So the structure of the erythrocyte is they are biconcave, meaning they have two, or on both surfaces, there's a concave side. So it um, makes like a little cave. It's the way I usually remember it. So uh, someone can go sit there in the cave. Um, so it has a biconcave side, so concave on both sides. They are flexible to allow them to squeeze through capillaries and they contain hemoglobin to transport oxygen and carbon dioxide. What is hemoglobin? Uh, so hemoglobin, we've touched on this in grade 9, but hemoglobin is the protein inside of red blood cells and it contains iron, um, so that is um, very important for the production of hemoglobin and red blood, blood cells is iron. So if you don't get enough iron into your diet, then usually you um, suffer from anemia, uh, which is a condition where there isn't enough red blood cells and hemoglobin to transport oxygen and carbon dioxide. So you get lightheaded very quickly. Um, they contain four binding sites, so it's now the hemoglobin, contain four binding sites for oxygen and carbon dioxide to bind to. So in grade 9, I usually explain this whole story of like how oxygen is transported throughout the body and how the red blood cells are like taxis. So if the red blood cells are taxis, then the, hemo or the hemoglobin would be the taxis and they would have four seats for carbon dioxide or carbon dioxide. Okay, carbon dioxide and oxygen form temporary bonds with hemoglobin, meaning they can easily dislodge from that binding site. Um, and w when they get to where they have to be delivered to, then they just um, they are dis dislodge from the uh, binding site. Um, and then something that's also important to note is that uh, carbon monoxide, so not CO2, but CO, uh, forms a permanent bond with hemoglobin. Uh, and this is a problem. So if you get carbon uh, monoxide poisoning, then it leads to headaches um, and it can even cause coma and death because you can imagine if all of the red blood cells get filled up with carbon monoxide, then they bind there permanently and then the oxygen cannot bind um, to the red blood cells and then you don't get oxygen. So carbon monoxide poisoning is very dangerous. Long-term exposure to high altitudes causes your body to produce more erythrocytes due to the low air pressure. Because there isn't enough uh, or there isn't that much oxygen available, then basically what your body does is it produces more red blood cells. Um, so it sends more taxis to collect every last bit of um, oxygen that you breathe in. 
So uh, that's why athletes at higher altitudes um, oftentimes have an advantage uh, because they have, when they go take part in competition at sea level, then they've got more red blood cells um, than athletes who live at sea level. Um, but this is a topic for another day. Okay, next we look at leukocytes or white blood cells. And white blood cells are um, what gives your body immunity. So they are the main uh, agents of immunity in the body. Um, you'll see here that there's many different types of white blood cells. Uh, we don't focus too much on that uh, or on the different types in grade 10 level, but just know that there are different types. Um, and then um, because they give immunity, they need to get anywhere in the body. They must be able to get to all parts of the body, all tissue in the body, so they can easily squeeze through uh, capillary walls to get where they need to get to. And then how do they give immunity? So this is a whole four-year course at university, so it can get quite complex. But basically, uh, two of the main ways is they engulf foreign bodies, so it means they um, swallow them up, basically, and then the cells digest them and get rid of them. Um, and they also form antibodies. So we'll look a bit at antibodies when in the next section. Um, but this is basically when uh, there's a marker on the cell called an antigen. And then the antibody binds to that antigen um, and uh, signals for um, the different cells of the uh, immune system to come and destroy that cell. There's many different ways in which it works, but a lot of it is mediated through antibody production. Okay, so different white blood cells have different Im immunological functions, uh, and like I said, that's three years at university, so we're not going to get too deep into that in grade 10. Next, we look at thrombocytes or platelets. Um, so platelets are little cell fragments that you find in the blood that are responsible for blood clotting. Um, so there isn't much more to say than this. Again, you can go study uh, the very complicated process of how blood clotting works, um, but for grade 10s, you just need to know how or that it is cell fragments that cause blood clotting. Then uh, the last part of the blood is the plasma. So that is the liquid part of the blood that allows the blood to flow. Um, so it's uh, what makes up most of the blood and it acts as a solvent. Um, so it dissolves salts, nutrients, vitamins, hormones, plasma proteins, oxygen, metabolic wastes. Uh, so it dissolves all of those things so that it can be transported um, either to cells that needs it or to be transported to the kidneys to be excreted or the lungs to be excreted. Um, so whatever, whatever it might be, um, the plasma, it helps to move those things around. Um, also, it obviously moves the, um, the, red, or the red blood cells and the white blood cells and the cell fragments, uh, helps to move them around as well. Um, but there's, it's your uh, blood system is your main transport system in the blood, uh, in the body. So everything has to be transported via the blood. Uh, it also forms the extracellular matrix. So here's that word we mentioned earlier, matrix. Uh, so this is the non-living part of the of the blood um, that you find in the blood. The main function is transport. Transport cells and substances to where they are required or excreted. Okay, so here's just the diagram that shows you the composition of blood. Um, so this is what we drew. So you should have all of those now. I just made it a bit simpler, made this little triangle. Um, but uh, basically, this is what you drew. And then if you separate all of those things out, then you see that the plasma makes up about 55% of the blood. White blood cells less than 1%, and then red blood cells about 45%. So here you can see most of the blood is the plasma, and then followed closely by the red blood cells. Next, we look at bone tissue. Now, bone tissue might look quite complex because of all of these complicated words that are difficult to say and even more difficult to spell. But if you write them out a few times and you practice how to spell them, uh, you will make it a lot easier for you in tests and exams. So make sure you know how to spell these words. 
So before we start with all of these different parts, let's just look here at the bone tissue. And you'll see that there's all of these circles, sometimes oddly shaped circles, um, all throughout. And those are called Hervesian systems. And that is where, uh, that is, if you zoom in on one of those units, that's where you will find all of these parts. So first, the um, Hervesian canal is the central part, which contains the nerves, the lymph vessels, and the blood vessels. And they transport, obviously, um, nerve signals um, and then nutrients uh, to the bone cells so that the bones can grow uh, and create new tissue. Then the next part is the lamellae. And those are these rings that you find around the Hervesian canal. So concentric rings around the canals. And in the lamellae you find lacunae. And these are these little black dots, which are little cavities where you find the osteocytes. And osteocytes are bone cells. So we said that connective tissue is tissue with living and non-living parts. So osteocytes are the living cells. And then the uh, matrix around it um, is the non-living deposits that gives the bone its strength. Okay, so lacunae, fluid-filled spaces with lame, uh, in lamellae that contains osteocytes. Then the canaliculi is small canals that connect the lamellae and the lacunae. So in between, if you zoom in a bit more, um, you'll see that there's these little lines in between the lamellae and the lacunae, um, and these are the canaliculi. Um, and they're also used for transport between the uh, lacunae um, and uh, lamellae. And then if you were to zoom out a bit, you would see that around the, um, and you look at the cross section of the bone, you would see uh, around the outside of the bone, there's the periosteum. And this is a fibrous membrane that encloses the bone. Um, there's also a few other parts that is not mentioned here, um, but this is really enough for uh, grade 10 level. Um, it's already quite complex, I'm sure. Um, so just make sure, I'm going to erase all this so you can see a bit better. Um, just make sure that you know these, these, how many is it, five parts. The Hervesian canal, the lamellae, the lacunae, the canaliculi, and the periosteum. Okay, then next, the functions of the bones are a lot more straightforward. Um, so firstly, it provides a supporting framework for the body. So your skeleton, without your skeleton, you would just be a blob of flesh. Um, it forms levers for locomotion. So if you didn't have bones, your muscle wouldn't have anything to pull against. So the bones provide something to pull against so that you can move. Uh, it stores minerals, produces red blood cells, and it protects certain organs, like your ribs protect your lungs and your heart, and your skull protects your uh, brain. So the functions of bones are a lot more straightforward. Yeah, you can see uh, just this different type of diagram. So uh, there you see the Hervesian systems, the Hervesian canal, the lamellae, the lacunae, and here you can even maybe see the canaliculi in between the lacunae and the lamellae. Okay, here you see an osteocyte. So that's the cell in the lacunae. Um, so you can have a look at this diagram um, in your own time and you can identify the different parts just to make it a bit simpler. But then important, you have to draw this. So this is the simplified drawing that you need to know. So this over here is a bit more complex. So that's a micrograph or a photograph of how uh, bone tissue looks like. Um, but you need to know uh, this diagram over here. Okay, so you need to draw it into your books. Um, you don't have to draw quite as many lacunae. You can okay, just draw about six or seven. It's fine. Um, but you have to draw this diagram into your books. Next, we're looking at cartilage. So cartilage might look similar to bone in certain ways, um, especially in some of the structures that you find and some of the names that you will see um, is overlaps with bone, uh, but it's quite different in its actual structure. So let's have a look at how it differs. So firstly, um, uh, a cartilage is tough rub as a tough rubbery matrix that consists of chondrin. Uh, so this is the um, the matrix around uh, the lacunae, uh, which 
um, gives uh, the cartilage this tough rubbery uh, matrix structure. The lacunae, so again that same uh, name that we saw, saw in bone tissue, is fluid full spaces that contains the chondrocytes. So where the, in the bone tissue it um, uh, contains osteocytes, in the cartilage it conta uh, contains chondrocytes. So these are basically just cartilage cells. So there you can see um, a chondrocyte. So there might be more than one chondrocyte in a lacuna, as you can see here. So there's two, there's three. Um, so so it's, so it's a bit different, uh, and it's a bit less structured than the uh, Vesian systems we saw with the bone tissue. The functions, um, so main function is it reduces friction at joints, or one of the main functions. Um, so in between all joints, you will find cartilage, and cartilage reduces the frictions between, uh, friction between bones of the joint, um, so that they don't rub right against each other and wear away over time, um, but they have this cartilage uh, layer that is um, very slippery um, to allow for frictionless movement or almost frictionless movement. Some of the other parts of the body where you find cartilage is in the ear and the nose, and it gives structure to the ear and the nose without requiring hard, uh, inflexible bones. So still some flexibility, um, uh, but gives those softer parts of the body some structure. It also acts as a shock absorber, so the discs between your vertebrae um, absorbs a lot of shock every time you walk or you jump. Um, if it was just bones, those uh, bones would have disintegrated a long time ago. So the cartilage provides some shock absorption and also flexibility. So because it's not as hard and immovable as um, bone, uh, it allows for flexibility in the body. Okay, so one of the examples where you see this is in the rib cage where the cartilage allows your ribs to um, move a lot more than it, if it was just bone all the way um, around. Okay, and again you have to draw this diagram. Okay, so here you can see a lot less structured than the bone tissue. Um, so you just draw a couple of lacunae like this with a couple of chondrocytes um, in between and then um, I didn't include any markings for the matrix itself for the chondrin because uh, it might get a bit confusing but just understand that there's in between these lacunae is um, a quite tough rubbery matrix that keeps the lacunae um, from just floating wherever they want. Um, so there is a matrix that is important to understand. Um, so just draw a line in between the lacunae uh, and that is the chondrin. Okay, then ligaments and tendons. So ligaments and tendons, of, people oftentimes get them confused. So we put them on one slide so that we can see the difference between the two. So ligaments join bone to bone, whereas tendons joins muscle to bone. Ligaments are made up of yellow elastic connective tissue called elastin and uh, tendons are made from a more white fibrous connective tissue called collagen. They, they have got uh, different fibers that make up the ligaments and tendons, um, but uh, a majority of the fibers in ligaments are elastin, whereas in tendons are uh, collagen. And then because of the structure, the ligaments can stretch, whereas tendons cannot stretch. Uh, because tendons are connected to muscles, and the muscles are the part that needs to be able to move. Um, the tendons need to remain rigid, whereas for ligaments, because they connect bone to bone, they need to allow for a bit of stretch so that your, so they don't snap every time you move quickly and, uh, or you quickly change direction. So. Um, so ligaments uh, is a lot more elastic in that sense. In the last type of connective tissue, areolar connective tissue. Um, so we mentioned this before with the epithelium. They bind epithelium to the underlying tissue. That's their main function and that's mainly what comes up when we ask about areolar connective tissue. Um, they contain yellow elastic and white collagen fibers. So they are elastic and strong. 
Uh, so kind of the best of both worlds. Then we move on to muscle tissue. So we've done epithelial tissue, connective tissue. Now we look at muscle tissue. There's three types of muscle tissue, skeletal tissue, smooth uh, muscle tissue, and cardiac muscles. Um, and you'll see that uh, they're quite different uh, in their structure and function. Uh, one of the main differences is skeletal muscle is found uh, all around the skeleton and they're used for movement. Uh, your smooth muscles are found in your organs and your cardiac muscle is just found in the heart. Okay, so first up we have skeletal muscle or sometimes called striated muscle because of the strut appearance that you'll see when we look at the tissue in a second. Um, so that's the first note as well, striations, uh, or st they are striped. Um, next, they have more than one nucleus per cell, so we say they are multinucleated, and you control when the muscles contract, so we say they contract voluntarily. Okay, so these are the three characteristics of skeletal muscle that you must know. They are striated, multinucleated, and contract voluntarily. Where do we find them? Attached to bones. Um, so that's how you produce movement, is by moving bones, so you always find them attached to bones. And their function is locomotion, movement. Okay, so muscles contract, uh, or muscles voluntarily contract and relax to produce movement. Okay, so yes, just again to organize yourself a bit. Um, it looks quite complex, but this is just to show you that how small we are actually going when we're talking about muscle fibers. So yeah, if you take your muscle, so a piece of your bicep muscle, let's say, um, then this is how it will look, a cross section of that. And then one of these bundles um, is, um, contains many different muscle fibers. And then inside of these muscle fibers, you find a micro, uh, myofibril, uh, and then inside of these myofibrils, you find actin and myosin uh, filaments, which we'll talk about those later. Don't worry too much for now. Uh, but we're going to focus on a section like this for now. So here you can see the muscle fiber. And then if you, if you look at one of these myofibrils, then that is what you will see. You will see these little sections called sarcomeres and then inside of those sarcomeres they are comprised of actin and myosin again we'll look at these later don't worry but these uh, sarcomeres is what gives these the striped appearance so that's why we say it's striated okay here you can also see the multinuclei so more than one nucleus per cell okay and then this is what you actually have to draw. Okay, so I know it looks a bit complex, but you just draw a couple of tubes like this, add a couple of nuclei in each one, add the striations, okay, because those are the important characteristics that you must be able to identify. I will also give you a printed out version of this, um, but you must be able to draw it, so draw this, and then you can, next to it, you can paste in a printed version of it. Okay, then this I will also give to you, print it out. This is just one muscle fiber. Uh, again, the uh, important part here is the nucleus. And here you can see the striations. Uh, and then it just identifies the different parts. Well, that's not too important for now. Okay, then here, yeah, if you zoom in, I uh, can't go back, but if you zoom in um, on one of those sarcomeres, then this is basically what you would see. Not doesn't look like this, but... Um, these are the elements that you will see. So you have the actin, which is the thin filament, and the myosin, which is the thicker filament. Okay, let's make it a different color. Um, and uh, they move over each other, uh, as you can see in this GIF over here. They move over each other, and that is what causes the muscle contraction. So these heads on the myosin, they move and they bind to the actin, and then they contract and they pull the actin, and then that is how your muscles contract. Okay, so this is not something that I would ask, uh, but it's just to give you context on how the muscles actually work. Then smooth muscle. Okay, so smooth muscle is not striated, 
only has one nucleus per cell and it is involuntary. You can't tell your stomach muscles to contract. You can tell your abdominal muscles, which are skeletal muscles, over your stomach to contract, but you can't tell the actual muscles in your stomach to contract and break up your food. That just happens involuntarily. Okay, so where do you find these? In your intestines and also in the iris of your eye. Functions. Okay, so one of the main functions is peristalsis. So if you remember from grade 9, peristalsis is, for example, in your esophagus, where if you're trying to swallow food, the muscle contracts and pushes that food down. And again, this is involuntary. If you've ever choked on something halfway down your esophagus, then you would know. Like your esophagus tries to pull it down and you might try to get it out again. Um, that is a very involuntary um, muscle action. And then uh, relating here to the iris of the eye, the um, involuntary muscles in your eye regulates the amount of light that enters the eye. So if you've ever entered a dark room or entered out of a dark room into bright sunlight, then you would know that it takes a bit of time for your eye to adjust to the light. Um, and that is an involuntary action that your eye does automatically. Okay, and then here's the diagram you have to draw for smooth muscle. Again, I will print it, but you must draw it as well. Um, so this one is a lot simpler. So you just draw a couple of these um, almost like eye-shaped cells. So it looks kind of like a cat eye with the nucleus in the middle. Um, you draw a couple of them. Um, they don't necessarily have to be this far apart, uh, but you just draw there what you see. Uh, and then that is the smooth muscle. Okay, so you have the nucleus and then the sarcolemma, which is the outside layer, and the sarcoplasm, which is the inside layer or the inside fluid. Okay, then the cardiac muscle, so the muscle, um, muscle of the heart. Okay, again, cardiac muscle is striated, um, but it only has one nucleus per cell. And also the contraction is involuntary. So some similarities with skeletal muscle, some with smooth muscle. Where do you find it? Only in the heart. Okay, and the function is to contract and relax the heart to circulate blood. Okay, that's basically what you need to know for cardiac muscle. It's found in the heart, contracts and relaxes to circulate blood, striated, uninucleated, and involuntary. Okay, it also works independently of your uh, the rest of your body, um, so it um, it works without needing input from uh, your brain. It just regulates the amount of blood um, that needs to be circulated. Okay, and this is the diagram you have to draw for cardiac muscle. So again, uh, you just draw the outside here, um, and then you can draw these striations and then the nuclei, and then you'll see that they form these parts where they come together and they uh, diverge from each other again. Uh, these are called muscle bridges. Okay, so make sure you include a couple of them, but the, how exactly you draw it is up to you, um, but you'll just make sure that you include a couple of these places where they diverge from each other or come together. Okay, we're getting to the end. We're almost done. Nervous tissue. Uh, so for nervous tissue, we there's some uh, variation we look at, but basically uh, we look at all of nervous tissue as one. Okay, so nerve cells are known as neurons. Okay, and so if I say neuron, then just know that's a nerve cell. The function of neurons is to conduct impulses or send signals, electrical signals, throughout the body. You have three types of neurons sensory neuron, motor neuron, and interneurons. Okay, we also refer to these as or sensory neurons as afferent and motor neurons as, as efferent. Well, I'll get into afferent and efferent in a second. Okay, so that's the basics of nervous tissue. So let's just look at some uh, parts of, uh, or uh, some terminology that we use when we talk about the nervous system. So firstly, sensory or afferent neuron transmits impulses from receptors to the central nervous system. 
So the main thing here is it goes to the central nervous system. So think to the brain. It's not just the brain, but just think to the brain. Then motor or efferent neuron trans uh, transmits impulses away from the central nervous system to an, uh, to an effector. Okay, so uh, away from the central nervous system, so think away from the brain. So it's signal on its way to the muscles, for example, okay, which is an effector. So uh, motor neurons goes to an effector like a muscle or a gland, something that brings about an, an effect. So that's why the motor neuron is also called efferent neurons, okay, because of the effector. And sensory neurons are called afferent neurons. I don't really know why F, okay, but if you remember motor is efferent, then sensory is afferent. Then in between these two, you find interneurons. So this is only found in the spinal cord to transfer, uh, transfer impulses between afferent and efferent neurons. Okay, so between the two, you find interneurons. Then receptors are structures. So they, they get many types of receptors, mechanical receptors, uh, osmo receptors, um, yeah, different types of receptors throughout the body uh, and basically what they do is they receive a stimulus of some kind so whether it is something um, cutting your skin or just something touching your skin or heat or cold um, so any kind of stimulus um, and it then sends that information about that stimulus to the central nervous system so this is at the end of uh, the sensory neuron or at the start of the sensory neuron you would find a receptor then an effector is at the end of the motor neuron uh, which is something that brings about a response like a muscle or a gland so we mentioned this before okay so here's an example of everything together so um, let, let's go through a common example of how all of these parts work together so firstly you have the receptor in the skin so let's say this is a receptor that detects the change in temperature so it all of a sudden got very cold so then this receptor would get a signal or would be stimulated and then would send information with the sensory neuron to the spinal cord and then once it gets to the spinal cord, the spinal cord would connect the sensory neuron with the correct motor neuron through an interneuron. And then that same signal will then be sent through the, um, uh, through the motor neuron to an effector, which in this case is a muscle. And let's say it is a drop in temperature that caused this signal, then that muscle might, might start to shiver to create more energy, to create more heat, to increase the temperature. So this is an example of how everything works together. Receptor, sensory neuron, interneuron. Okay, so just replace that interneuron. Motor neuron and effector. Okay, so we almost at the end. So here you see the three different types of neurons, sensory neuron, interneuron, motor neuron these i will give to you to paste in you don't have to try and draw them um, but uh, make sure that you know the labels and we're going to discuss the different parts in a second or in the next slide um, so make sure you leave about half a page open to paste in these different neurons okay so here's just a, a different diagram so it's the same picture as earlier or it's also a motor neuron um, so just a different picture that looks a bit different uh, yes you see a synapse but I'm not going to get into how this works just now in class I might explain this a bit but for now this is not important okay so the structure of the neurons so these are all those labels that we underlined in the uh, pictures um, these are what all of those different parts do so we'll just briefly go through them so firstly the dendrite is the uh, part that I'm going to draw a little neuron over here just to make it a bit simpler 
Um, so the dendrite is the part that um, that transports the impulse to this, the centron or the cell body of the neuron. So that part. Okay. Then the axon is the part that transports it away from the um, cell body. So the dendrite goes to the cell body, axon goes away from the cell body. Then the neurolemma is uh, a part of the neuron that repairs the neuron, so part that repairs the neuron, um, outside of the central nervous system. Myelin sheath is the, uh, you would have seen there's these little rectangles that looks like something wrapped around the, um, the neuron, that's exactly what it is. Um, and it uh, insulates the neuron so that uh, the electrical signals, because it's basically, the signals are basically electrical signals, so those don't jump between neurons. Okay, so it insulates them, and then in between those myelin sheaths, there's a little space called the node of Ranvier. Um, and these um, speed up the conduction of the impulses, so they actually jump from node to node. They jump from node to node, um, to increase the speed, not on the outside of the um, uh, myelin sheath, uh, but uh, in the neuron itself. They speed up between those nodes uh, to increase the speed of the um, signal being transmitted. And then lastly, the synapse. Um, so I said I'll explain this in class because it's quite difficult to do without drawing. But basically, at the end of the axon, and the start of the um, next dendrite uh, or effector or wherever this signal is going, there's always a gap uh, and we call this gap the synapse. Um, and this ensures that the signal can only go in one direction, but it cannot go back. Um, so to prevent anything weird happening in the body with signals going in the wrong direction, you have synapses. But the way it works is a lot more complex and it's actually very interesting. Um, but I'll explain that in person um, or maybe in a different video one day. Uh, but it's a bit, can't really do it on this platform. Okay, so that is it. That's everything. Um, I see we're just over 50 minutes. So a bit longer than I promised. But if you, if you do all of the work that we did in this 50 minutes, you write all of it down, you understand everything, then that is one week of working in class. So you can do one week's worth of work in class in 50 minutes at home. So that's why I urge you, stick to the program, just do the work, do a bit of work every day, and uh, it will greatly decrease your workload once you get back to school. And then you can sit in class and you can relax while everyone else has to write down. Okay, so um, I hope you guys at least have some time to relax and I hope you guys are safe and I hope we see each other in two weeks time and it's not, uh, it doesn't get extended this lockdown. Um, but yeah, stay safe and see you guys soon. Oh, and by the way, if anyone made it this far into the video, I'm willing to give you 20 Rand if you post, let's say, Synapse, if you post comment synapse on uh, Google Classroom somewhere, I will give you 20 Rand because I, for some reason, doubt anyone made it this far into the video. But if you did, well done.